It has been known for a long time that some patients with seizures originating in the temporal lobes have intense religious auras, intense experience of God visiting them. Sometimes it's a personal God, sometimes it's a more diffuse feeling of being one with the cosmos. Everything seems suffused with meaning. The patient will say, finally, I see what it's all really about, doctor. I really understand God. I understand my place in the universe, in the cosmic scheme. Why does this happen? And why does it happen so often in patients with temporal lobe seizures? My attitude was I was God, and then I had heaven and hell in my eyes. That was it, you know what I mean? I was the, the grand guy who created heaven and hell. John's epileptic seizures are essentially an electrical storm in his temporal lobes when a group of neurons start firing at random, out of sync with the rest of his brain. Recently, John experienced one of his worst episodes to date. For nearly a week, he had eight seizures a day. Each seizure lasted about five minutes and involved violent convulsions that left him unconscious. I basically had made plans with an ex-girlfriend to go out to the Salt River in Arizona, out in the desert. This girl likes to drink a lot. And to keep up with her, I uh, started drinking vodka martinis, and I went into some serious seizures out there. Later that day, John somehow managed to get a call through to his father, who immediately drove out to the desert to bring him home. On the way home, him and I just got into some philosophical, you know, questions about everything, and I just would not shut up. Once I got on the way home, I was going and going. It was like I was wired. It's basically an earthquake within the body. And like any earthquake, there are aftershocks. Mainly what I deal with is the aftermath, particularly with this last episode. It was very much like stepping into a Salvador Dali painting. Okay, it, instantly everything was surreal. And that's, in essence, what his seizures are all about, the aftermath. Um, where it puts his brain, where it puts his memory, where it puts his mind, his thinking ability, everything else. When John eventually came through this last episode, he was exhausted, but he felt omnipotent. I went running down the street screaming that I was God. And then this guy came out and I was just like pelvic thrust at him and his wife. And I was like, you want to effing bet I ain't God? And I said, literally, you asshole, get back in here. What do you think you're doing? You made me. Come on Come back on, in. Right. Come on back all in right, right now. I'm Come going, on. I'm going. Come on. You know, you're disturbing the neighbors, you're going to call the cops. What is this all about? All right? All right, all right, all right. Okay. All right. You're not God. <laughs> I kind of just looked at him cool and calm and apologized to him, and I'm like, no, no one's going to call the police. Like, it, I didn't say this last part, but I'm thinking to myself, no one's going to call the police on God. John was introduced to Ramachandran by his doctor, who knew of Ramachandran's interest in disorders that straddle the boundary between neurology and psychiatry. John had had a recent seizure, which made their encounter very emotional. When I listen to certain types of music, I have this connection with another world, almost. And it's very hard to convey it to another person. Uh, yeah, if you were to ask my dad, he would just say, I am completely through the gateway and into a, another reality, 100%. Mm -hmm. Indeed, a separate physical reality is every bit as real to him, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Although it is absolutely nothing like this reality is to us. I have looked in his eyes in those times, and I have seen, seen a cry for help. I've been in so much pain that I'd rather be shot to death, dude, or just whipped to death. Mm -hmm. Whipped also, to also death. Joy? Yeah, I've Sometimes. been in so much joy that I would rather 
be left alone, man. Get, get, take, take everything away and just let me sit there and have that much joy. I feel like I can float and stuff sometimes, you know? Okay. It's just, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like the best. People, people just go, what are you talking? I've done, I've gone, done all kinds of drugs and things and been with, you know, women. And I just go, you don't understand, man. Very first seizure I can remember, he was 17 years old. Okay. So and until 17, he was kind of pretty much like any other kid. He went through the usual adolescent problems. Very the, much but, so, yeah. But otherwise, was your family, are you religious or is he religious at, before that time? Uh, not, uh, not, no. Now, why do these patients have intense religious experiences when they have these seizures? And why do they become preoccupied with theological and religious matters even in between seizures? One possibility is, well, maybe God actually visits them. But if that's true, as a scientist, I can't test this. There's no way of finding out. One possibility is that the seizure activity in the temporal lobe somehow creates all kinds of odd, strange emotions in the person's mind, in the person's brain. And this welling up of bizarre emotions may be interpreted by the patient as, as visits from another world uh, or as God is visiting me. Maybe that's the only way he can make sense of this welter of strange emotions uh, going on in his brain. A third possibility is that this has something to do with the way in which the temporal lobes are wired up to deal with the world emotionally. As we walk around and interact with the world, you need some way of determining what's important, what's emotionally salient, and what's relevant to you versus something trivial and unimportant. Now, how does this come about? We think what's critical is the connections between the sensory areas and the, and the temporal lobes and the amygdala, which is the gateway to the emotional centers in the brain. The strength of these connections is what determines how emotionally salient something is. And therefore, you could speak of a, a sort of emotional salience landscape with hills and valleys corresponding to what's important and what's not important. And each of us has a slightly different emotional salience landscape. Now consider what happens in temporal lobe epilepsy. When you have repeated seizures, what might be going on is an indiscriminate strengthening of all these pathways. It's a bit like water flowing down rivulets along the cliff surface. When it rains repeatedly, there's an increasing tendency for the water to make furrows along one pathway, and this progressive deepening of the furrows artificially raises the emotional significance of some categories of inputs. So instead of just finding lions and tigers and mothers emotionally salient, he finds everything deeply salient. For example, a grain of sand, a piece of driftwood, seaweed, all of this becomes imbued with deep significance. Now this tendency to ascribe cosmic significance to everything around you might be akin to what we call a mystical experience or a religious experience. He has a seizure, he'll want to talk philosophy. He'll want to discuss all the things that are floating around in the stew he's got up here that he's trying to reconstruct. Mm. Thoughts that he may have had just, just floating through his mind while he was in a seizure mode uh -huh. may come surfacing. I see. Okay. Also... But also uh, you said he's become more emotional because, because of the seizure, so that's, mm -hmm. that's helpful too. Much more sensitive. But oddly enough, not in regards to himself. Okay. okay. 
Okay. But in regards to atrocities, disasters, things like that, anywhere and everywhere. Oh. Wrongs done to other people. Jesus Christ. And Yugoslavia, you know. Yeah. It's, oh, God. But you know what? Yeah. A lot of times I sit there and go, okay, um, there's a reason for ethnic cleansing. Mm -hmm. It's right. And I sit there and totally justify it in my own head. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I 100% justified, 100% right for the human race. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. And you know what? I am so right in my own head. I know I could go out there and get people to follow me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, not like these wackos with sheets on their heads. Not like those idiots. But now it's just the new generation of the prophets. Yep. And are, were all the prophets people that were flopping around on the ground? Is that what this whole message was? The gift from the gods this whole time? That's possible, isn't it? Yeah. I've never been religious, ever. The one I compare myself to is Noah and his ark. Us saving our earth as a ship. I would say he was a prophet too and did something about it, saving everything by getting two of each. I just know it's not going to be 40 days and 40 nights, everyone. It's going to be 40 billion years before we're ready to take off in that ship. Ramachandran's proposal that John's intense religious feelings may be the result of faulty wiring in his temporal lobes raises a fascinating question. Might all our brains be in some way hardwired for religious belief? A few years ago, the popular press inaccurately quoted me as having claimed that there is a God center or a G spot in the temporal lobes. And now, this is complete nonsense. There is no specific area in the temporal lobe concerned with God. But it's possible there are parts of the temporal lobes whose activity is somehow conducive to religious belief. Now, this seems unlikely, but it might be true. Now, why might we have neural machinery in the temporal lobes for belief in religion. Well, belief in religion is widespread. Every tribe, every society has some form of religious worship. And maybe the reason it evolved, if it did evolve, is that it is conducive to the stability now, of the Now, the next group of patients we studied were patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. And it's been known for a long time, people with seizures originating in the temporal lobes, epileptic seizures. Normally, you think of epileptic seizure as being a grand mal seizure. And you have, a, you, know, you have a seizure involving the whole body. You stop breathing. You utter a loud cry, and you fall down. But in fact, there's a group of seizures, a kind of seizure called temporal lobe seizure, or psychomotor seizure, which is purely a mental seizure, an emotional seizure, but doesn't necessarily involve a bodily seizure. And What's astonishing, there are many symptoms of this, emotional upheavals and uh, extraordinarily emotionally loaded experiences, a turmoil of emotions that the patient experiences. But the most striking aspect of these people is not only during the seizures, but interictally, when they're not having seizures, they have extraordinarily, they have tremendous religious experiences and mystical experiences. They say things like, during the seizure, I experience God. I see the meaning of the universe, the true meaning of the universe, for the first time in my life. Everything is deeply significant. I understand my place in the cosmic scheme of things. That's what they say. And this happens also in between seizures, but primarily during seizures. Sometimes they'll actually say, I'm talking to God, or God is talking to me. Now, why does this happen? Well, there's four or five hypotheses. One hypothesis is maybe God is visiting and coming to see them. And you can't discount this on, for any, on, on the basis of any scientific evidence. Although I would say, you know, saying that God works in very strange ways. Uh, but it, I find it strange that she would manifest herself in temporal lobe seizures, only in epileptics. But, you know, we don't know. Okay? So, first of all, the idea that God visits you, and I can't disprove that. The second idea is they're just mad. You know, they're just nuts. They're crazy. Something is going on in the temporal lobes. They become crazy, and they believe in God or believe in something. Well, that doesn't work because uh, I've seen other crazy people, people who are schizophrenia, who really are crazy, and majority of them don't necessarily believe in God or become religious. Some of them do. They'll say, I'm Napoleon, or I'm God, or I'm George Bush, or whatever. Okay? But majority of them 
don't necessarily believe in God, but in temporal lobe seizures, a substantial proportion, maybe 30 to 40 percent, have this intense religious fervor and belief in God. The second hypothesis, third hypothesis, is that maybe there is this cauldron, given that it's limbic system where the seizures originate, and the limbic system is very much involved in emotions, there is this cauldron of emotions, this emotional turmoil in your mind, and then the left hemisphere kicks in. In the left hemisphere, we know from a number of experiments on split brain patients and indeed on stroke patients, is involved in confabulation. If something doesn't fit, doesn't make any sense, the left hemisphere tries to spin a yarn to try to make things more consistent. So maybe when there is some strange, something bizarre going on in your mind, which is otherwise inexplicable, the left hemisphere starts confabulating and saying, the only way I can make sense of this is there is a visitation from another dimension, i.e., maybe it's God is visiting me. Okay, in other words, God is the ultimate confabulation by the left hemisphere. Okay. Now, another hypothesis is, and I can't rule that out. That's a possibility. Another hypothesis is kindling. That is, when any one of you look at the world, you look at objects around you, look at people, what happens, the messages cascade from the retina into the visual areas of the brain, visual cortex, and about 20 or 30 visual areas in the brain, and you compute the statistics of the world, you look at features, you analyze the features, finally you recognize objects, and objects then produce the appropriate emotional experience. In other words, the amygdala, which is the gateway to the limbic system, performs an emotional surveillance and looks for emotional significance. If something like a predator or a prey or the dean or something very salient like that, <laughs> you're emotional or something sexual, you get emotionally aroused and you start sweating and your heart starts beating faster because of autonomic arousal that takes place and you're preparing the body for feeding, uh, feeding fleeing, fighting, or sexual behavior, as the saying goes, okay? So all of this takes place instantaneously, very, very quickly. And maybe what's happened to these patients is because of the repeated volleys of temporal lobe seizures, some of these connections have been indiscriminately enhanced. And when that happens, everything becomes deeply significant and salient. So normally when I look at this, you know, if I look at a pinup or I look at a lion, I get aroused. But I look at this, I don't get aroused by a bottle of water. But these people, because of the kindling, Everything and anything they look at is deeply significant. And they see infinity in a, in a grain of sand or whatever. And they see everything they look at is deeply profound and deeply significant. And this is akin to many, what many religious mystics talk about, seeing deep significance in all everything in the cosmos. Now, how do you test that idea? Well, we said, OK, let's measure their sweating. You can do this with a galvanic skin response, where the sweating changes. When you look at something significant, you look at uh, a, 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 a lion or a tiger, or you look at something sexually provocative, then you get a huge galvanic skin response. If you look at a table or a chair, your galvanic skin response is flat. You don't react. What happens in a temporal lobe epileptic? We said, well, if this hypothesis is correct, anything and everything should produce a big jolt in the, temp in the galvanic skin response. So we did this experiment. We showed them, of course, lions and tigers, they get a big galvanic skin response, or a pinup, they get a big, oh, I take that back. Lions and tigers, violent scenes, horrible scenes, they get a big galvanic skin response. But we show them things which are utterly trivial, like bottles of water or a shoe or a, a pen or something. Nothing happens, as in a normal person. In other words, the theory that this is just the kindling and everything is deeply significant is disproved. In fact, when they look at sexually provocative images, they don't get a galvanic skin response, unlike most normal people. right? And this is consistent with the fact they actually have hyposexuality. Their libido is reduced in temporal of epilepsy. But now comes the important finding. When we showed them religious icons, like a Star of David, a cross, or a word God, or the word Mary, the word Jesus, there's a big jolt on the galvanic skin response. Showing, and what we said in this abstract at Society for Neuroscience about what, eight, nine years ago now, that something is going on in the temporal lobes in temporal lobe epilepsy, and maybe in all of our temporal lobes, there's a group of neurons which is firing in abnormal manner, which makes you more prone to religious belief, okay, believing in a, in a deity or in, in, in God or whatever. And this, these neurons are hyperactive in these people, hence the propensity to religious belief. That's all we said. In fact, at the end of the abstract, the last line was, this does not prove there's a God module in the brain. But the press got hold of this and went crazy and said, 
Ramachandran has discovered the God center in the brain. And in fact, the Bishop of Oxford was questioned about this. And he said, well, so what? It just shows that when God made us, he put an antenna in all our brains, and it just happens to be in the temporal lobes. Fine, OK? So anyway, and the, the, for some time in the internet, there was a talk about a G spot in the brain. <laughs> okay. All right, so now the question then is, why do, you have, why do you have this neural circuitry in your brain whose activity gives rise to religious belief? Finally, there are two possibilities. One is it's a spondral. In other words, it's doing something else in the brain which has evolutionary benefit. I don't know what that might be, right? Belief and maybe, it, it, uh, I don't know. I don't want to even speculate. The other possibility is it was, in fact, selected for by natural selection because, in fact, uh, look at every religion, every society, every tribe in the world. They have some kind of religious belief. Uh, and this rituals, the belief in a hierarchy, the, the ritual chanting, the mantras, the dances, all of that, confers a certain stability and order on society. And maybe that's what provided the selection pressure for the em emergence of religious belief and God. Finally, let me conclude by saying none of this has any bearing on whether God really exists or not. As I said before, this is all about how a religious belief originates in the brain, and that's all, that's all I have to say. Thank you. So do you have any, um, there will be some questions, and obviously Richard wants to ask, but could, could you just comment very quickly on the recent um, Time magazine or the book by Dean Hamer where he talks about God in the brain, the whole notion of that? Um, I'm afraid I haven't read it. So okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll, we'll come back to that later then. Richard, do you want to? Just a simple factual question. Well, I, oh, I know. Uh, a simple factual question. Um, the temporal lobe epilepsy people showed a strong galvanic skin response with religious icons. Do you, you didn't say, I think, whether normal people do. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, when we look at normal people, you, well, I don't mean normal religious versus normal atheists, okay? There is that question. But when you look at uh, normal, just anybody, you find, in fact, a high response to violence and a high response to, especially heterosexual, but not very much to religious icons. In fact, you can even look at religious people, and you don't get that much of an enhancement in religious response compared to temporal epilepsy. 